This is a poster summarizing our project studying Japanese knotweed and related plants in Wisconsin. Japanese knotweed and related species belong to a genus called Renutria. And this group has been classified a little bit differently in recent years. Uh, for a while there, it was called uh, Polygonum cuspidatum <clears throat> for the Japanese knotweed, which then became Fallopia japonica. And uh, phylogenetic evidence now supports this classification in the genus Renutria. As it currently is classified, this is a smaller genus of only about five, of only five species. Uh, they're native to Eastern Asia. The countries and uh, political regions highlighted in green here are the native range of the whole genus. And we'll see a few of the species, uh, including Japanese knotweed and another one called giant knotweed. Uh, its scientific name is Sakhalinensis, which is native to this island here called Sakhalin Island. Uh, Japanese knotweed, of course, this is Japan. Here we have the Korean Peninsula, bits of Russia, lots of Eastern China, uh, and also Southeast Asia. So a uh, fairly narrow native range and a rather extensive invasive range, as we'll see. So the invasive range, this is a species, a few species that are invading in Europe and North America. Uh, they've been problems where they're not native and uh, they've been active targets of control and study to try to identify them. So that was kind of the motivation for this project was trying to learn a little bit more about identifying these plants and maybe developing some tools for uh, identifying them and potentially uh, exploring this possibility that there are uh, extensive hybrids between these two species. So the two parental kind of pure species are known as giant knotweed uh, for obvious reasons. These are two pressed specimens shown at the same scale. Giant knotweed is capable of making these really big leaves. So besides their uh, large size, one of the features that helps identify giant knotweed are these big lobes at the base of their giant leaves. Uh, there are lobes in giant knotweed and in Japanese knotweed, the bases of the leaf blades are truncate. So they're just straight across at the bottom. That's one of the useful features that can be used to identify uh, the, the species. But as we'll see, of course, there are potential hybrids between them. Uh, the hybrid between them has a name that's called uh, Bohemian knotweed, Renutria bohemica, and uh, that one has, as you might expect, intermediate morphological characteristics, uh, according to the sources that have uh, studied that. So this is a plant that's uh, problematic. It grows very large, uh, can grow using vegetative reproduction to fill a small area, uh, fill an area and compete out other plants. It has chemical tools known as allelopathy that uh, one knotweed plant can actually kill its neighboring plants as a form of competition. And uh, for this reason, and because of its extensive uh, seed production, it's able to spread pretty far and wide. And as with the case with many invasive plants, this is a plant that for a while there before it was really classified as an invasive plant, and probably to some extent still uh, is actually being moved around intentionally by people because it's an attractive plant and uh, little do they know, right, how uh, problematic it can be. So uh, we work in Wisconsin and we were working with the Department of Natural Resources here to try and get a handle on what is the genetic diversity of the species of knotweed uh, in our state. So this is an example of a broader picture of uh, North American diversity and you might find a similar picture if you uh, investigated diversity in Europe. And of course we plan to do that moving forward using the interesting results we've seen so far. Uh, the background of this image shows the reported ranges of the two uh, parent species. So the giant knotweed, Renutria sacalinensis, is in this uh, orangish color, uh, distributed much more to the north. And the blue color is the Japanese knotweed, uh, distributed a little bit more, say, southeast Lake Michigan, but also pretty extensively throughout, kind of evenly throughout the state. And then the hybrids have been reported, uh, I guess a little bit more outside of the state boundaries uh, into Minnesota for the most part. And so we aimed to uh, do some DNA investigations using samples from pretty well across the state, uh, at least some representative corners of the state to see what kind of genetic diversity was there, to see if molecular markers would be able to identify uh, parent species and their hybrid. And, uh, 
So we, we collected samples and also looked at their morphology as a, a method to identify them using uh, more traditional methods. And then we also looked at their, their DNA data. So uh, as far as getting the DNA data, we used a couple of genes that have been used before. That's pretty standard to investigate something that's known to be useful in a group. So uh, this group, the knotweeds, belong to a bigger family known as Polygonaceae, uh, which also has a common name of knotweed for some um, herbaceous smaller plants and so on. And uh, using the tools we had, we were getting signal from the chloroplast using the MATK gene and also from the nuclear uh, region, the nuclear chromosomes using this leafy gene. So primers have been developed for leafy in uh, knotweeds and other members of the family have been investigated using leafy, specifically the second intron of this gene. So introns are a little more variable and offer a few more, uh, a little more evidence as far as looking for unique sequence combinations in individuals. And this is an example of the alignment we got for the leafy gene. So you can see some locations where there are uh, nucleotide substitutions, A's versus G's here and so on. Uh, other locations where there are gaps, so insertions or deletions in some sequences relative to others. And uh, all told, this is the basis for our phylogenies that we'll show you in a little bit here. So we use the traditional primers that have been developed and uh, early on in the process, we also determined that there were different uh, multiple sequences from single individuals, which some, sometimes happens as a result of uh, hybridization, sometimes happens as a result of uh, polyploidy, which is known to exist in this group. But at any rate, it was hard to tell the two kinds of sequence apart from one individual. So we developed primers that were specific to the uh, Japanese knotweed types of sequence and the giant knotweed types of sequence. And that allowed us to get uh, clean versions of different gene sequences from the same individual. So our results looking at the phylogenies, this is the phylogeny of the MATK gene. Again, that's that chloroplast gene. And chloroplast genes are inherited from one parent only. So uh, this is a little bit cleaner uh, evidence there should be typically uh, one kind of chloroplast for an individual. So uh, we're getting strong signal for these individual plants being either Japanese knotweed uh, or giant knotweed. Not to say that they would be identified as such, but that would be the basically the parent, the, the female parent for most times uh, that would have been their female parent line of inheritance. So uh, most of the individuals that we were studying came back with this Japanese knotweed type in blue, and just a small handful of them had the uh, giant knotweed type in orange there. The background sequences that are not highlighted here, these are sequences that were developed by other researchers from uh, the native and the invaded ranges, so uh, lots from Japan and Korea, and then a few, here's one from New York State and the United States, Ohio, another one from Wisconsin. So. Our sequences are falling in with what has been reported. Uh, curiously, our sequences for the giant knotweed type really hadn't been reported for North America before. So uh, I don't know if that just <laughs> something people hadn't got around to or just hadn't found them yet. And that was, a, like I said, a cleaner picture. The complicated picture comes when you investigate the leafy gene uh, leafy gene is a nuclear gene, so nuclear chromosomes exist in two copies in diploids. These are plants that are known to be tetraploid, so four chromosome copies, uh, not only tetraploid, but also other ploidy levels. So it's possible that they can have uh, four, six copies of chromosomes in these individuals. And with each copy of the chromosome, potentially they get a different kind of leafy sequence. So that's why this <laughs> got a little bit messy. Um, fortunately, you can identify the kind of sequence on its own and then determine whether a single individual has more than one sequence present. So uh, some of our individuals had only one kind of leafy sequence. That was a little bit easier to determine. Uh, a lot more common was what's shown with all these lines connecting things at the right is that a single individual, let's follow this line, for example, a single individual had a uh, Sakhalinensis type, a Japanese knotweed, 
I'm sorry, giant knotweed type of sequence here. And in the same individual, uh, there was also a Japanese knotweed type of sequence. So uh, normally that's pretty good evidence that you have a hybrid between two species. And uh, we do interpret that as the case for most of these, but we also seem to be finding some evidence of more kinds of hybridization. So uh, not only hybrids between two pure parental species, but also maybe hybrids between uh, crosses between hybrids, hybrids back crossing to parents and so on. So we certainly aren't 100% sure about how all of the genetic combinations came about, but this is one way to think about how they might have originated uh, with some potential parent individuals and the genotypes that we observed. So everything with a box around it is a genotype that we found in our study. And uh, the ones without boxes are basically, some of these are pure versions of the species that may have existed in an individual, uh, or they may have been because these are polyploid individuals. There may have been only uh, starting individuals that had two combinations of sequence already. But at any rate, uh, we see lots of combinations of hybrids. So there's no real clear pattern as far as J1 and J2 and S1 and S2 and so on. Uh, almost every combination is present among these different uh, leafy genotypes. So uh, we may have to investigate other markers or get a little further uh, finer detail on this or investigate source populations or something and try to find a, a little more clear idea of who the parental species were, where they were, when they were introduced, and things like that. So if we put these back onto the geography of Wisconsin, uh, we see, similar to what I was mentioning at the beginning, that there are uh, a little more plants identified as Japanese knotweed in the southeast. Uh, that's a little more Japanese knotweed types of DNA for the, the chloroplast, which is the uh, upper part of these pie charts. And individuals that came in with the giant knotweed chloroplast sequences, these are a couple of these 24 and 37 uh, found in the north of Wisconsin. The bottom half of the pie shows the leafy contribution. And we see that most individuals that we sampled uh, would come out as hybrids. So one form in the blue shades, which is uh, Japanese knotweed, and one form in the, the brown and orange shades, which is the giant knotweed. And it uh, looks like almost, well, certainly the majority of these have um, a combination of Japanese and, and giant knotweed elements in their nuclear DNA. So uh, this helps to explain a little bit why we were having some trouble identify these, identifying these using their morphology and uh, really opens a lot of uncertainty about what we would find if we looked in other parts of North America, if we got this same kind of sequencing from uh, Europe and so on. So uh, I think we've made a, an interesting contribution to knowing what is out there as far as genetic diversity in this invasive species group and uh, lots of room for future investigations.